But we wanted to start on our foundational series called We the People. Now, when you build something, you know that it's all about the foundation, right? It's so important that you build on something that will last. You see, if we just winged it over time, this thing will just fall apart. But we're so thankful that we are, we are building our church on values that are displayed in the Word of God. Me, uh, I grew up in Southern California, um, and i just only been here almost a decade. My wife was born and raised in Mission, Kansas. You know, that's just a few miles away from here. So when we first moved out here, I didn't even have snow clothes because, like, we just didn't have snow back then, you know? We just, we had the mountains and that's it. So I don't know if you remember, about six years ago, we just got a massive snowstorm. It was awesome. You know, like, we were, like, locked in for two or three days. Like, our family in California, they were texting us, are you okay? We're like, of course course we're okay. We're like, we have no power. This is awesome. It was so much fun. And then all of a sudden, my kids, they wanted to build a snowman. And so how hard can it be, right? Just You just roll up some snow and you just make a snowman. So what I decided to do is I decided to go outside and I was going to shovel our driveway. And we had this real steep driveway at the time. And it was like full of ice. And I went in my jeans and my Jordans and just a sweatshirt. So I looked like Dumb and Dumber at the end. I was just frozen. You know, I was just rock solid. And afterwards, my kids wanted to look for their sled. It would probably be a good idea to find the sled before it snowed because it was buried outside. So we went, we looked for the sled, and I'm frozen. And my wife, she was supposed to be making warm soup in the house. So I was looking forward to that. And then afterwards, my oldest, we have six kids, and my oldest, she was like four or five at the time. She's like, Dad, remember, you promised that you will build a snowman with me. And so I was like, honey, can we build it later? She's like, you promised. You know what I'm talking about? If you have you know, nieces and nephews, they look at you with that look. You're like, dang it. Okay. So I said, let's build a snowman. So I'm just like being lazy about it, you know, and I don't think it's the right snow. And I see my wife, if you're married in here, you'll know what I'm talking about. I see my wife with this evil smile looking through the window and she's totally judging me. I was like, I, I was like, what is she smiling at? And so she's supposed to be making soup. Like I already said that before, right? She's supposed to be, but she's looking at me and she's like, you're so not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And so I just kind of like get a couple sticks, you know? And so this is the snowman that I built with my daughter right there. Not anything impressive, right? So my wife, she's like, she was pregnant at the time. She's like, I'm going to show you how uh, you build a snowman. She, so she runs out in just a sweatshirt. She had sweats on. She's pregnant. She put another pair of gym shoes on, and she goes to town. She gets on our knees, and she starts building these big old massive snowmen. I was like, what is she doing? So she left the soup undone. I was kind of mad about that. So I was eating cereal as I was watching her. And like any loving husband, don't put it up yet, because I, has anybody prayed this prayer? I said, God, if you ever love me, please send a gust of wind to blow that thing down right now. I, that's how competitive I am. I was like, God, if you love me right now, answer this prayer. And he didn't answer my prayer that day because this is the snowman that she built. <laughs> my wife is so uh, crazy. Oh, don't clap. Don't clap. <laughs> that's so messed up. She even, she's, all, she's so cocky, she made it upside down. Now go back to mine. So that's, <laughs> and go back to hers. Do you know there's not a winter that goes by that they don't remind me of that snowman? Every single time a flake of snow comes down from the heavens, they remind me every single day about that snowman right there. You know, I thought we didn't have the right material. I thought we didn't have the right snow, but apparently my wife knew what she was doing. And, and so for us at Vive Culture, we don't want Vive Culture. You could stop it, all right? Could you just get rid of the snowman? We don't, want our, we don't want our church to look like that wimpy snowman. We want to build something that lasts, amen. And so we want to dive into the Bible tonight, and we're going to look at the book of Colossians. And it's amazing when you begin to dive into this foundational um, value that we're going to be talking about tonight. As soon as you hear it, most people say amen right away. But listen to it really um, closely. It says, Jesus is central in everything that we do, that's a value of ours. We have to start there. Now, a lot of us, especially if you've grown up in the church, a lot of people say amen, right? But the more you begin to walk with people and the more you begin to listen to people and listen to their marriages and how they raise their kids and how they spend their money and how they invest their time and their resources, the more you begin to see that we as Americans have begun to adopt a half gospel. And what do I mean by that? I mean there are lies 
that sound great on bumper stickers and t-shirts and even in some worship songs that don't necessarily line up with the Bible. One of those things that you might have heard is, God won't give you anything more than you can handle. Have you ever heard that before? They've used to, I grew up in a traditional church. They always used to say that, Brian, God will never give you more than you can handle. I'm like, really? Is that what the Bible teaches? Because when I open up the Bible, most of the time he gave people more than they can handle, so they were forced to lean into him. If he only gives you and me all that we can handle, then why have faith? Another one they used to tell me all growing up is cleanliness is next to godliness. Did anyone ever hear that one before? Brian, cleanliness is next to godliness. I was like, that is not in the Bible. Another one that I love so much is that they used to tell me this when I was in college. They say, don't worry, Brian, it's all going to work out if you just have enough faith. Really? Is that what the Bible teaches? Because in Hebrews, it says the heroes died without seeing the full promise. So it is so important that if we're going to say Jesus is central in everything that we do, we have to know what that really means. And for us, that means that every single thing that we do, whether it's singing or serving or in our vocations or sharing life with people, everything that we do, Jesus must remain central. So we have to understand the whole gospel so we can allow Jesus to be the center story and the main attraction of everything that we do. And a good place to start is in the book of Colossians. I heard a couple weeks ago when I was talking to someone, they were just, they just shot a saying at me. They said, hey, Brian, you know what? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm like, how depressing. And they were kind of taken back. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, that's, that's not what the Bible says. If you are a Jesus follower, you are not just a sinner saved by grace. If that was the case, the apostle Paul who penned most of the New Testament, he would have started all the letters like, hey, just you slackers, sinners saved by grace. Peace to you. But what does he say in Colossians 1? The very beginning, he says this. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, grace and peace to you from God our Father. It's amazing when you begin to understand who you are and what he rescued you from how it changes everything. And I want to give you a little history before we dive into Colossians because it's so important to know that this is a very interesting letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to Colossae because everything that we know is Paul never actually went there himself ever. But he just began to hear rumors of, of what was happening in this new church. See, several hundred years before the Apostle Paul even arrived onto the scene, Colossae was a very influential city. To just give you a little history, it's Turkey now in our modern day. It's Turkey. But back then it was very influential, but over time it began to become a second-rate community, and people began to leave that area, and they began to spread to other regions and other territories. Just to kind of give you a picture to just kind of make it even more clear, it would be like people lived in the city, and they moved to the suburbs, and all of a sudden, there was classes that were built. And it was like, oh, you live in Colossae? Oh, that's where those kind of crazy philosophies and those crazy people and like, oh, we just kind of stay away from there. And what happened is the Apostle Paul begins to arrive on the scene. And there was this Jesus movement that was happening in Ephesus. And people were getting saved and churches were breaking out all over the place. And people in Colossae begin to get this new revelation because when Jesus really begins to change your life, it changes everything. And they were so excited to go back to their city and begin to see a Jesus movement happen there in their town. See, that's what happens when Jesus really grabs a hold of your heart. It doesn't need no promotion. A changed life is the best promotion ever. You don't need a mailer. You don't need a social media account. When God really begins to change your life, it changes everything. And so these people begin to take this revelation into Colossae, and they begin to see this Jesus movement happen. But any time that you begin to take ground back from the enemy, what happens? They begin, to, they begin to have this opposition come after them. And they were kind of battling between the old Jewish uh, rituals and just the legalism, and they were beginning to battle this new age philosophy, and they were just trying to warp it all together, and they were just getting frustrated. And they were just thinking to themselves, what can I do to be better? What can, why, I, I got to do more. I got to give more. And I just want to address the elephant in the room tonight. There is nothing that you and I could do to be better. 
you're like, thank you for that motivational speech. I'm so glad that I came out tonight. But if you would just hang with me, hopefully grace and truth will grab our, our life tonight because way too often people say this, I promise I will never do that again. God, if you give me one more chance, I'll never look at that on the screen in the middle of the night again. I promise you, I'll never be tricked into sleeping with this person again. I promise I'll try even harder if you just give me one more chance. This time, I really mean it. Anybody ever been there? So what we're not asking you to do is go out and try harder and do more, but rather we are inviting you into the invitation of Jesus to die to self-trying and self-ego so Jesus can live in and through our lives, which means Jesus is central in everything we do because Jesus is the center of it all. Yes, now there's purpose in how we are as Jesus followers. And can I be honest with you? You and I don't get to pick and choose the things that we want to be obedient to. And that's what we're beginning to see in 2018. And so many Christians are adopting a half gospel and they think it's a, a buffet. And they want to pick and choose the things that they're obedient to, right? They're like, man, I love the favor. I love no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I love so much that my family is going to be blessed. Mm, I'm not too sure about committing my gifts. I'm not too sure about planning in the house. I'm not too sure about being faithful to my finances. Ooh, but I love the favor. I love the blessing. If you're a parent in this place, that would be like you telling your kids um, to, to follow these instructions and then picking and choosing the things that they would be obedient to. That doesn't work in, that doesn't work in our household. I don't know if it works in yours. Let me go a little bit further. That would be like if I was about to get married to my wife and the day before our wedding, I was like, you know what? I'm really good at doing the lawn. Now, I'm going to say this. I am awful. This is why I'm using the analogy. I am awful. Come over to my house and you'll see my lawn. I do not have the gift of taking care of the lawn. But I'm going to just say for the analogy, I'm going to say, you know what, God, you have given me the gift of taking care. So what I'm going to do to serve my house is I want to make sure I take care of our lawn. We're going to have the best lawn on the block. It makes me feel good. Everyone's going to say, what a great lawn you have. Mm, I'm not too sure about the emotional connection part of marriage. I'm not too sure about coming home every single day. Ah, you know what? I like the tax write-off. You know, that one's cool. I'm not too sure being married to one person. I'm not, I, I'm not really feeling that. If I said that, you would say you were crazy, right? That's not covenant. That's not commitment. Now think of how God must feel when we come before him and we say, you know what, I want to pick and choose the things that we want to be obedient to. And so Jesus is calling us as a generation. If Jesus is going to be central in everything, every area of our lives, we're going to have to understand what that really means because trying harder, doing more, singing louder, giving more money, giving more time is not working. So we got to dive into Colossians and see what does it really mean to Jesus is central in everything we do. And I want to tell you, you can't live that out on your own. And some people tonight, that's going to be so frustrating for you because for so long you like to be independent. It's like, that's my gifts. That's my time. That's my money. That's my relationship. But for many others, hopefully this will be refreshing for you because you are exhausted from trying. And I want to tell you, there is good news tonight. That is a, it is possible for us to keep Jesus central in everything we do. So in Colossians 1.24, if you're going to dive in there tonight, if you have your Bible, it'll be up on the screen. It says this, now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction. So this is the Apostle Paul writing to this New Testament church. He says, for the sake of his body, which is his church, Verse 25, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God. Listen to this, in its, what's that word? Fullness. He says, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Paul is saying that there is a prophesi prophecy that was coming. And it was hidden before to all the heroes of the Old Testament. But now he's about to make these mysteries renewed. That mystery that was kept hidden from ages and generations, but now it's going to be disclosed to us. And this is what he's saying. He says, to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches 
of this mystery. Stop really quick. Basically, he's saying that all the heroes of the Old Testament did not know what he's about to say right now. That means Joshua, Joseph, Ruth, Daniel, all the heroes of the Old Testament did not know these mysteries, but now it's going to be revealed to us. And he just drops the mic on them. He says this, he says, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Which means that if you and I are going to keep Jesus central in everything we do in this generation, it's not going to be by trying harder or singing louder or doing more. It's going to be dying to self-ego and to self-trying and to allow Jesus to become central in everything that we do. So if you and I are just a sinner saved by grace, then we always have an excuse why we do what we do. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I can't help it, right? I just do that because that's just the way God wired me. You know, take it or leave it. You see, when sin infected the gene pool of sin, it's very important that you understand from that moment all the way back into the book of Genesis, it changed everything for humanity. You see, sin didn't make us bad people. It made us dead. So you were in need of a behavior modification. You were in need of a savior. And that's totally different. And when you understand where you were or where you should be, if not for grace, it changes everything in the way we approach, approach who he is. So when Jesus began to absorb our shame and our rebellion, it was not a partnership. And for those who place their hope in Jesus, it changed everything for us. That's why we sing the way they do, we do. That's why we serve the way we do. That's the way we give the way we do. That's the way we share life the way we do with people. That's the way we see our city, not as disgusting, but we love our city. We can't wait to run into our city every single day because of what Christ has done inside of us. We can even go a few verses back to Colossians 1, 21 through 22. It says this, it says, but now, uh, it says, but once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior. Verse 22, listen to this. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and without, what free from accusations. This is what it means. That's, that means that when the moment you place your life into Jesus, he no longer sees you. He no longer sees what you used to be, but now he sees his son. And now he says, no, you are a son and a daughter and you are marked by majesty. I don't know about you, but that fires me up. That's not like someone just helped you change a spare tire on the side of the road. You know, that kind of, that kind of gratitude is just like a pound or maybe take them out to lunch. But when you understand where you were or where you should be and that Jesus rescued you, you know what the church should be like? It should be like the chief stadium today. You know what I'm talking about? Like people are going crazy for a person they never even met. I guarantee you most of those players on the field don't even know you or I exist. And yet worship is happening all over that stadium. How much more should the church come alive every single Sunday because we know where we used to be and where we are because of Jesus? Listen to this verse right here. I love this. In Colossians 1.9, it says, We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, that you may live a life, listen to this, that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. If you want to know how to please God, you got to listen to this. It's not by trying harder or doing more. It says this, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Verse 13, I love this. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves and whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I'm getting fired up. So this, I love this. Verse 15, the son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And listen to this. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him 
And what? And for Him. For who? For Him. Every single thing you have, every single thing you own, every breath you breathe from this moment on was created by Him and for Him. Verse 17, just a few more verses, church. It says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. A couple more verses and we'll wrap this up. It says, where God was pleased to have all this fullness dwell in him, meaning Jesus, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but listen, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. One more verse. If you continue in your faith, which means if you walk forward, if you're obedient, if you stay faithful, if you are continuing your faith, established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, listen to this. This is the gospel. I'm going to say that again. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, has become its what? It's servant. I'm telling you, I can't read those verses. And I can't help but just feel this overwhelming um, sense of gratitude. Do you know how much heaven had to pour itself out to get you out of where you were? He's already been faithful. He's already made you worthy. So now it's our job to live like it, to act like it, to love like it, to serve like it, to give like it. Because if he didn't answer one more of your and I prayers, what he did on the cross over 2,000 years ago would be more than enough for us to give our entire lives to. But yet he not only called us, he qualified you, which means you don't need a seminary degree, which means that you don't need a social media account. You don't even need a microphone. All you need is your story and you can walk into your workplace. Student, you can walk into your campus and you can walk into wherever you go into the city and you can say, man, I, I am living, I am living proof that Jesus not only saved me, but he qualified me and he called me. That's not to say that we don't sin. Of course we sin, but he no longer looks at you as a sinner. He no longer looks at you at what you used to do or where you used to run because I believe with all my heart, there is no heart that is too hard that he can't turn it. There is no one too evil that he can't use. There's no one that has ran too far away that God can't call back home. And he is calling you and I at this moment. He's saying, this is the gospel. It's not how hard you try. It's not how many Bible verses you memorized. It's not who you know. Here at Vibe Culture, the rock star image that so many people are just infatuated with makes us sick around here. We don't care if you rolled in a Jaguar or you rolled in a, a one of those bird scooters that is so popular in Kansas City. We don't care. We don't care if you're known on a global stage or if you're only known on your block. We don't care how many social media followers you have. We grew up in Southern California. We are not starstruck around here. So many people are trying to build their churches and their brands and their businesses on the backs of other names. And we're like, man, if we're going to build this thing, there's only one name we care about. And his name is Jesus. Amen, church. That is the only name we care about. That means when you walk in this place, we don't care who you are. We don't care what you've done, that you have a place here. Because we understand that, man, we, we know there is a lot of things that we've done in our past. But, man, we know we have so far to go. But thank God we're not where we used to be or where we should be, if not for grace. Amen. There's an expectation that we have every single week of when you come into this place that we want this place to feel at home. Where no matter what you're walking through in your life, no matter what your marriage looks like, no matter what your finances look like, no matter what you've done, you could have done something last night or you could have done something 10 years ago and you've been covering it up. We want you to know that the gospel is not what you do and it's not dependent on what you do or who you know, but the gospel is about Jesus. It's about him coming down and him shedding his blood and coming back to life again. And now when the father looks at you, he no longer looks at you and he no longer looks at me, but he says, man, that is my son and that is my daughter. And because of that, we have a place in heaven. I cannot just sit back and just say, cool, thanks. But heaven poured out everything for us. 
I love this verse as I wrap up. This verse says this. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Push pause really quick. I am so thankful there is a comma after that verse, not a period. That comma is very important. I'm so thankful it didn't say for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, period. And I don't know where the lights are on, but I'm going to keep preaching. But look what it says. It says comma but being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is Christ Jesus. What is that saying? That's saying that that comma gives you and I an opportunity to respond and say, man, I am a sinner. But because of Jesus, I can now come before him and say, you know what? I'm going to say from this moment on that my life and my finances and my gifts and my time and my resources, Jesus, you're going to be central in everything that I do. It's not going to be like it's this hometown buffet where I get to pick and choose, but no, everything, everything is made by him and for him. And from this moment on, I'm going to be faithful. From this moment on, I'm going to live like I'm worthy because you are worthy because of Jesus. He has marked you by majesty and don't take that lightly. And so as we respond in just a few minutes, Maybe you're sitting here in this place and this is the first time you maybe actually heard the the whole gospel because for all your life you just maybe grew up in a religious system and you just try harder, do more. If you just say this prayer, if you just kind of give the good deeds, if you kind of just give enough in the offering, you'll be forgiven. That's not how it works because it was not a partnership. When Jesus absorbed all our shame and all our rebellion, he paid a debt he did not owe. And we had a debt we could not pay, but thank God for grace, amen.